Now we're going to look at the last passive process. And remember, passive means you don't need to put any ATP in. The last passive process is osmosis. Osmosis is basically diffusion, except for instead of looking at the solutes, the things dissolved, you're looking at the movement of the solvent. Uh, in our case, water. So water wants to move to help equalize concentrations of solutes. So over here, there's lots of water. There's solute molecules on this side. So water wants to move over towards the solutes to help make these two sides more equal. You can kind of think of it as there's lots of space for our water on this side, so water is more highly concentrated. And there's not very much space for water on this side, so it's got a lower concentration of water. So it moves from where it's more highly concentrated to where it's lower. And it actually has such a driving force that it's, it defies gravity. It'll push against gravity to move. Okay, so we look at uh, differences in concentrations between areas to see how water will move, and we use words to compare areas. Uh, we look at their tonicities, how much solute they have, how concentrated they are. Hypotonic, hypo means low, hypoallergenic, low allergy causing. Hypotonic, low solute levels. Hypertonic, high solute levels, hyperactive, high energy high solute levels. Isotonic, equal. So you're comparing two areas and they have the same amount of solutes, the same amount of stuff dissolved. Let's look at how that applies uh, to life. Our red blood cells, when they're done, they lose their nucleus. They don't have any way to regulate water movement. So it's totally based on the difference in solute levels between the red blood cells and blood. So in an isotonic solution, where the number of solutes on the outside equals the number on the inside, water is moving equally in and out. When you've got a hypotonic solution, that means it's really watery on the outside, whereas the red blood cells would be lots of proteins in there that had more solutes. Water's going to move into the cells, where it's at, got more space here, less space there, so it moves in. That can cause the cells to swell and even rupture. And then in a hypertonic solution, say lots and lots of salt in the water or in your blood, water moves out of the red blood cells into the salty area to try to equal the concentrations and the cells shrink. Now let's look at active processes. Active processes, you're pushing things against their concentration gradient or moving really large molecules. Those both need energy input. First we've got primary active transport. Here you're using ADP to directly move molecules against their concentration gradient. Uh, the example we have here is the sodium potassium pump. There's lots of sodium outside your cell, not very much inside. So pushing them from where they're low to high, the way they don't want to go, takes energy. And then potassium has the opposite uh, concentrations. There's more potassium on the inside of the cell than the outside. So we push it more into the cell against its concentration gradient. Yep. And this is going to be very important for our cell charge. Our cells have lots of negative proteins on the inside, less positive ions, lots of positive ions on the outside. So our cells are more negative. That's going to be important for generating signals for like action potentials in your nervous system, sending electrical signals, and muscle contraction. Uh, the sodium potassium pump works as an antiporter. What that means is it pushes sodium one direction, potassium the other. So they go in opposite directions, anti-opposite. Uh, a symporter would be if we pushed both things the same direction. So there's a nice overview of the steps of the sodium potassium pump. Okay, now we've got secondary active transport. Here, we don't use ATP directly. Instead, we're using a concentration gradient we set up earlier using ATP. Uh, so a lot of the times, that's the sodium gradient. And we talked about how there was lots of sodium outside the cell. Our sodium potassium pump kept pushing it out. So sodium really, really 
wants to move into the cell. It's got all this potential energy built up to diffuse down its concentration gradient. In secondary active transport, we let that molecule diffuse down its concentration gradient. But by doing that, we're able to take another molecule, a second molecule, against its concentration gradient. For example here, like we've got glucose. We always want to keep bringing more glucose, more energy into the cell. So we'll bring sodium down its concentration gradient and glucose against it. So we're able to get more glucose into the cell. There's no ATP used here. We used it before. And last we've got vesicular transport. Vesicles, membrane-bound sacs for moving larger items. So endocytosis is bringing things into the cell. We've got receptors on the plasma membrane. They form this vesicle. They bring it in. And there are two types. First, phagocytosis. Phagocytosis, phago-eating. Uh, so like our immune cells will take in like bacteria and break them down. So they're, they're basically eaters. Here you've got a white blood cell bringing in a bacteria with phagocytosis. The other type of endocytosis we have is pinocytosis. This is kind of like a sampling of your environment. It's much smaller. So now the cell can see what's in there um, and have a, a, a taste of what's out there. The next, exocytosis, sending vesicles out of the cell. So here we've got a vesicle that was maybe like holding hormones or neurotransmitters that's made in the cell. And when it gets the signal, it moves it to the plasma membrane and then it releases its contents to the outside. And then that vesicle just becomes part of the plasma membrane. So when we look at organelles, we'll look at how this will be important for getting different things onto our plasma membrane. When we looked at the sodium potassium pump, we looked at that the cell had a charge. That charge is the resting membrane potential. Negative proteins inside, less positive ions makes our cell negatively charged uh, compared to the outside where there's more positive ions. Okay. There's some review questions for you. You can pause and answer them. Now let's get into the parts of the cell. So inside the cytoplasm, you've got the cytosol, the cell fluid, solution, the cell fluid. That's got the water and solutes in there. And then you've also got the organelles, the different pieces of machinery that do different jobs. Okay. So all of this is cytoplasm, cytosol, organelles. First, you've got the cytoskeleton. This helps give the cell its shape. Next, centrosome centrioles. Uh, we'll look at this a lot with mitosis, uh, cell division. These guys are going to be important for making our spindle fibers that help send DNA to two new cells when the cell divides. Cilia and flagella. These are important for movement. Cilia are kind of hair-like. They help move substances across the cell surface. So you'll find this like on your mucous membranes to move mucus. Uh, for example, in your trachea, your windpipe, you've got cilia that help move the mucus away from the lungs. So any bacteria, particles that get caught in the mucus, the cilia keeps pushing it up until we can swallow it. And flagella is for the movement of a whole cell. So for example, we've got a sperm cell they use locomotion by moving the flagella. It helps propel the cell forward. So this shows you how they have this cilia that moves in a wave-like fashion, pushing things forward across the surface. And there's the flagella helping to move the cells. Next, you've got ribosomes. Ribosomes have two parts, and when they come together, this is where we make proteins. So we'll look more later, but the RNA will come in here, it'll get red. We'll keep adding amino acids together until we make a protein. There are two types of ribosomes. There's free-floating and membrane-bound. 
So some of the ribosomes will just be floating in your cytosol on their own independent, whereas others will be bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. Free floating, they make proteins that are used inside the cell. Ribosomes on the endoplasmic reticulum, they usually make proteins that get sent out to the plasma membrane. Okay, endoplasmic reticulum, you've got two types, smooth and rough. What's rough is that they have ribosomes. That's what makes the surface textured. So uh, the rough ER makes proteins that will get sent out to the plasma membrane. Smooth ER is going to be important for making lipids, lipid synthesis. Uh, it also detoxifies. Your liver cells, they have lots of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, so they can help um, remove toxins like alcohol. They're always going to be right outside the nucleus. Right outside the endoplasmic reticulum, you've got the Golgi. The Golgi is kind of like the post office. The endoplasmic reticulum sends all the lipids it makes, all the proteins, through vesicles to the Golgi. They move through the Golgi um, like the post office, it packages things, it adds uh, like lipids and um, it adds sugars to them, so it like modifies, and then it ships it out with vesicles to its uh, destination where it has to go. So here, endoplasmic reticulum, transport vesicle to the Golgi, proteins move through there and get sent out. Lysosomes are next. Lyse means breakdown. So cell lysis is the breakdown of a cell. Lysosomes have digestive enzymes and they break things down. Uh, when things are old, organelles, they'll, they'll take it to the lysosome, they'll break down like proteins, down to their building blocks so we can reuse them. White blood cells have lots of lysosomes, so when they, we take in bacteria through phagocytosis, the bacteria then fuses with the lysosome and gets broken down. I actually had a previous student who had a lysosome imbalance, uh, mucopolysaccharidosis. There, they weren't making all the enzymes necessary, uh, so they couldn't break everything down. And that meant that they'd have molecules accumulating in their body. Uh, so like, her eyes were very cloudy because she couldn't get rid of the proteins there. Next, peroxisomes. Peroxisomes are a lot like lysosomes and they break things down, um, but what they do is they do these oxidation reactions where they uh, use oxygen to break down uh, substances into hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, which is toxic. So then they break that down into water and oxygen. So they're taking toxic things down twice, getting water and oxygen out of it that the cell needs. Next, proteasomes, they help break down proteins. Now we've got mitochondria. Mitochondria are probably the coolest organelle we have. They're just like a bacteria. They have their own DNA, their own proteins that they're making, and you get them from your mom, which is neat. So people will use mitochondrial DNA to look back at their heritage farther back. You and all of your siblings with the same mother should have exactly the same mitochondria. And the endosymbiote theory, and remember a theory is the strongest word we can use for evidence, uh, there, that says that at some point in time, a long time ago, a cell with a nucleus took in this small bacteria, and it's even got a layer of our membrane on the outside, and used it. The reason that mitochondria are so helpful and it helped the cell so much is that they make ATP. They go through reactions where they break sugars down and make energy. So the thing that people usually remember from their biology class is mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It makes energy. All the things that need to do work in our body, the active processes, are done by ATP that mitochondria make. And then in the next video, we'll look at the nucleus.